In this video, we're going to talk about the activities of project management. What is some of the work involved in managing a project and how does that apply to HR? That's coming up right now. there, I'm Andrea Adams and the host of HR Shop Talk. On the show, you get expert insight into all kinds of aspects of HR. I encourage you to subscribe to the show by clicking on the button at the bottom of the screen or subscribe to the podcast to keep learning from my smart and experienced guests. Today, my guest is Steve Lemex. Steve has decades of experience in project management and is a project management professional. I came across his name when he was delivering project management training specifically to HR people, and I knew at that point I wanted to talk to him. We've already done one episode together, and I'm excited about this one too. Hi, Steve. How are you? Hey, great. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming on. And I'm interested in this one. We'll get into the nitty gritty here. So first question, and I think I asked this question in the last episode, but can you talk briefly about the models of project management and what you think is best suited for HR? Right now in industry, there's a great debate between traditional waterfall project management, which has been, like I mentioned earlier, has been around for decades, you could argue yeah. centuries, and then this new emerging project management approach called Agile. Mm -hmm. And a lot of organizations, any organizations with, or any projects rather with an IT component mm -hmm. are starting to figure out how can we adopt Agile into the mix. So Agile works great and where it's designed and really shines is in when there's IT components on projects. So to your question, HR projects, Anything that involves IT, you may be seeing Agile becoming more and more common mm -hmm. in a lot of organizations. Can you talk about the steps of project management? First thing I do is I do what's called initiate the project. So we get together with management early on before we plan the project. So we sit down to find it, capturing this thing called the charter. You know, what's in scope, what's out of scope, what are we going to do, what are we not going to do? Get everybody on the same page. Your number one job as a project manager is to set stakeholder expectations. So this is one of your early attempts at this. Yes. Also in project initiation, I figure out who the stakeholders are. But yes. all the key players, so I know who to go talk to when it's time to do requirements and define needs. Okay. Number one reason for project failure, and it doesn't matter if it's IT or any type, is poor requirements gathering, poor requirements. Okay. So it makes sense to find out who my stakeholders are early, mm -hmm. so I know who to go to get talk, I know who to go talk to, to gather requirements. Not okay. doing that leads to something called scope creep. Yeah. It's, we've everybody's seen scope creep. Right? Scope, we define the yeah. scope, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger yeah. and uglier yeah. and out of control. That's well, scope creep. That meeting with management, like how long does that take? Honestly, if I, if it was me, the way I used to do them is I draft up a charter, okay. give it my best shot, yep. bounce it off management either physically or through email or maybe virtual, and yep. just have them react to it rather than trying to create it as a group. Yeah, I would have them. It's much quicker if they just react to it. You know, change this, add that. I don't like this. I don't like that. And then get your your key managers to have them react to it, edit it, and away you go. Okay. So I mean, what? In some projects, it could be like a day or two. Yeah. Other projects, it might be a week. I mean, huge, you know, politically sensitive internal projects, yeah. it might be longer than that. Depends on your organization. Right. Pub public organizations might be a little bit slower, but that's just the way it is. Okay. So after initiation, then what? So project gets blast or the project charter gets blessed. Mm -hmm. Man says, yeah, we like it. That's what we want you to go plan. Uh, so at that moment, we're officially into planning which means then as the project manager, I pull together what's called my matrix team, my planning team, which is usually a core of internal experts that are gonna help me now plan the project, which means when I sit down with my team, I define the scope or at least bring them up to speed on the scope, which was defined in the charter. Mm -hmm. Then we send our business analyst, ideally if we have one, we'll send our business analyst off to start doing requirements gathering, mm -hmm. which means they need that stakeholder list, right? That we did earlier, hand it to right. them and say, look, Here's the people we need to talk to. I'd like to know your elicitation plan, how you're gonna reach out to these people. And some might be interviews, focus groups, surveys, questionnaires, that's up to the BA to decide how they're gonna reach out to these various folks to get their needs. Yeah. Right, so then the, yeah. what I want from that, the end of all of this for my business analyst is the requirements document, clearly defined requirements. And ideally from everybody, not to forget anyone, 
Right. So what if the, scope in the first step you created a charter? What if the requirements you discover in the planning phase don't they are greater than what's basically allowable by the charter? Always happens. <laughs> okay, almost, good. What you said almost always happens because don't forget charters. I like to think of those are just almost guesses because I haven't talked to anybody yet, right? Okay, all right. So I can I can guess what I think we're going to need in the charter, so everybody's on the same page. Then we kind of verify it with requirements. Okay. And it's not unusual at all to have char or charter level time and cost estimates to go right out the window. Yeah. Now I had one project where we had a, we thought it was going to be four hundred thousand dollars in the charter. We planned it to end up being two point six million. Wow, but I don't apologize for that because charters. I don't know what's going on yet. I I haven't really planned the project, so okay. I don't get nervous if I'm the PM. I, I I'll go back and say, look, you know, we were wildly off. Here's reality. Let's talk. Uh, when you get that massive difference in requirements versus the charter, you go back to your management team and you say that wasn't realistic. And at that point, they're making decisions. Mm -hmm. And they may have to make some hard decisions. We can okay. downscale the charter. We can uh, massage the objectives. Okay. We can downscale the scope in the charter. Okay. If you know, we find out it's too big, we wildly underestimate it. That's fine. Okay. But I, I want management to know this so they're in control and they understand yeah. that they're making the decisions. So what's the next step? Well, there's a couple more parts of planning. Okay. We talked around nailing down the scope of the team. Yeah. Getting the be off, running off, doing the requirements. Concurrent yeah. to that, I need to start creating, identifying all the tasks which means create something called the work breakdown structure, okay. which generally is identified. It's three things. You identify your project phases yes. and with each of the phases, what are your phase deliverables? What are the things that you're going to produce? Okay. Like a requirements document or a system design, those are deliverables. And okay. then the last thing is what are the tasks? All the steps required to produce those. So mm -hmm. it's like a roadmap of yeah. all, all the tasks and deliverables for the whole project. That's called the work breakdown structure. I do that with the team. I also do a risk register mm -hmm. to identify, you know, possible risks, foreseeable risks, mm -hmm. and then it's time to sequence. So sort of the last major part is now I sequence the task to create my project schedule on a calendar, okay. which now I can start putting dates to things, right? Okay. So at this point, I would also then, of course, do my time and cost estimates well, before I'm sequencing. So I do my time and cost estimates, then I sequence. So at the end of this, I've got my time, I've got my schedule created. I've mm -hmm. got my project budget for my estimates and I've got my scope defined. So my time, cost, scope, my triple constraint, I've got those defined. So those are the key things that get approved in a project plan. And then after project planning comes? Once a plan gets approved, officially blessed by management, you get the green light, they say start, go, okay. which means now we move into execution, which means the work starts. Yeah. So the team executes, they do the work, they start producing deliverables and doing the tasks. Concurrent to that as a project manager, I'm monitoring and controlling. So my job is to go around with the magnifying glass and make sure everybody's on track and doing their things. I'm looking for any variance mm -hmm. against my approved time cost scope baselines. Mm -hmm. And almost always there is variance. So then the question becomes, what do you do about it and how you bring it back on the plan? Mm -hmm. And I just ensure that all the way through to a final end deliverable gets signed off on. So execution goes from when the plan gets approved all the way through to final end deliverable gets approved and signed off by your key managers and sponsors. Okay. And, and, then, then, the and then the last part, close out, which most organizations do a terrible job of this. My old company, we didn't do a very good job at all, which means there's two main parts of close out. I close any contracts with vendors. If yeah. I have vendors, if yeah. it's only internal people, I don't have to worry about this. But if I have vendors coming in under contract, I close those out. Those are legal documents. Mm -hmm. So I have to deal with procurement to do that. And then I do contract or administrative closure, which is disband project offices, sell equipment, possibly performance reviews of staff, most importantly, postmortems and lessons learned reviews, mm -hmm. which is hugely helpful to find out what went right and what went wrong mm -hmm. for next time. Mm -hmm. And ideally, I learn from mis previous mistakes, right? You said that uh, the closeout is usually done badly. Uh, or not at that... all. Or not or at all. At all. <laughs> well, my company, we used to just tear off onto the next exciting project. We'd make the same silly mistakes over and over oh, because okay. we didn't do those final postmortems and lessons learned reviews. Right. So there's huge value there. And I would say there's huge value if, some, if something important happens is 
those reports just don't get thrown into a drawer never to be seen again. Right. Ideally, those should be stored on a share drive where everybody now moving forward can access those, right? Do you do them now? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've learned the hard way. Yes. Okay. Those are huge. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> those are valuable. Okay. Oh, All yes. right. Those are key. Okay. So in HR, we're often, you know, our boss comes to us and says, hey, do this and do it fast. Yep. Um, and maybe that's the same outside of HR, but often it's also a weird and absurd request. So I have two questions. Is that common? And uh, how do you manage it? It's very common. And to your point, it's not just HR. It's all projects across all organizations. Part of your job as a project manager is to set and manage expectations, right? Right. So when management wants the project done for free yesterday, yes. I mean, part of my job is to gently push back and say, look, why don't we sit down and define the project first? Yep. Then we'll plan it with the team properly, find out what it's really going to cost, how long it's really going to take, what's a reasonable scope. And, you know, boss, you and I can sit down and come to agreement on this so we're on the same page. Then we'll bless the plan. You bless the plan. Mm -hmm. Then we'll start the work. Right. What I see far too often is there's very little planning, if any. We just roll up the sleeves and start the work. And then you're like a dog going around trying to chase your tail, mm -hmm. trying to, first of all, define the project once it's already started. Yeah. So that's an absolute re recipe for scope creep, where you know, scope just gets bigger and uglier because we haven't defined it up front. It's hard to push back on your boss. It is. Do you like, have any tips, suggestions, yeah. uh, evidence that we can pull out of our pocket and say, hey. Well, first of all, you need to know that it is your job to gently nudge back. I won't say push, I'll call it nudge. I need to nudge back to management. Part of your job as a responsible project manager is you're the reality checker, right? Management can dream up all this stuff they want done for free yesterday, but my job is to figure out how and yeah. sit down, plan it properly, you know, do it, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to beat it to death, do it fast, plan it properly, then mm -hmm. go back to management and negotiate. Now, are, is management, first of all, used to this? Probably not. Are they mm -hmm. going to like this? Probably not. Okay. Is it your job? Yes. It's uh. absolutely your job as a project manager. And I'm not saying no, I'm going to go back to management with options and say, look, boss, you know, you're saying, you know, hundred thousand dollars in six months, I'm saying $200,000 in nine months, let's talk. Right. Right. Let's see if we can come to agreement somewhere in the middle. I can prove why it's 200,000 in nine months. Yeah. I know you want it done in six months and a hundred, but let's talk. Let's see if we can negotiate this. Yeah. You know, you say that um, managers don't usually like it when you push back like that. And I imagine you've had to do that. <laughs> A lot. Lot, lots. A lot. Lots. Do you, did you, for the number of times you've done that, have you learned any, you know, tricks to make that go better? Yeah, hard numbers. The world management lives in, be able to prove it. You can't just go in and say, I think it's going to be 200,000 in nine months mm -hmm. because that's what my gut says. You're going to have to come in and prove it on paper, which okay. means you're going to come in with you know, schedules that you can prove and say X number of weeks. Yeah. You need to come in with spreadsheets and say, here's the dollars. Here's why. Here's my rationale and explain it to them. Yeah. Then we talk, then we negotiate. Yeah. I'm not saying no, I'm not saying no, I'm not going to do it or it's impossible. I'm just saying you want this. I'm saying that let's negotiate something in the middle that's realistic and achievable. If you have found this helpful, subscribe to see all the episodes and comment. Have you been asked to deliver a project in an unreasonable space of time, how did you deal with it? Let us know in the comment section below. Is there a most important step in project management? And if so, what is it? Three things. I would, I would answer three key things, which to me, the absolute cornerstones of successful project management. Okay. One is the charter. Yes. Sitting down to define the project, what it is and what it's not before you plan. Yeah. So everybody sort of launches from the same spot. Yeah. The second thing I would say absolutely key is the work breakdown structure. Okay. absolute cornerstone of a solid project plan is being able to identify your phases, your deliverables within each phase and all the tasks okay. because everything springs from the WVS thereafter, right? All your time and cost estimates spin okay. out of the work breakdown structure and where your resources get assigned spin out of your work breakdown structure mm -hmm. and your schedule is sequencing of the tasks mm -hmm. from the work breakdown structure. Okay. So that's, that's the second most important, that is probably the key one. Equally important, risk management. Mm. Managing risk throughout the project, all through execution, proactively managing risk. PMI has an interesting statistic on that. They say that 
if you are proactively managing risk, every team meeting, every time you get together with a team, you review the risk register and yep. forward scan to look for possible risks, yep. up to 90% of risk can be foreseen and managed. Speaking about risk, what are some risks that we should be considering or thinking about? Well, to answer that, I mean, there's different types of risks. There's what's called known unknowns, which are foreseeable, predictable risks. And then there's okay. unknown unknowns. Okay. So it's like 90, 10. 90 is the known unknowns of the 10. So you can have technical risks, budgetary risks, resource risks, political priority risks, vendor risks. Right. So smart project managers will identify the key categories of risk depending on my project, like an I, like an LMS system rollout. You could probably identify you know 10, 12, 14 categories of risks. And then a great team exercise is then with the team, sit down and try and identify specific risks that might happen. Okay. Which then, which then you assess them, probability and impact. Typically right. probability on a scale of one to 10, impact on a scale of one to 10. Like mm -hmm. some risks are more likely to happen, but more severe if they do happen, right? Mm -hmm. Other risks could be really high probability, but a really small impact. You know, I suppose a risk on a on an LMS is that your you know your technical resources is safe or are taken away too soon. Oh, put money on it. Yeah, you'll lose resources. You could have yeah. budget cuts. You can have requirements oh. change and evolve. Right. You could have key stakeholders change their mind. You wow. could have key stakeholders leave or get promoted, and wow. somebody comes out with different priorities. Yeah. Right. You could okay. have technology risks. Right. If okay. it's vendors involved, you can have vendor risks. You can have procurement risks. You'd have contracting risks. Okay. So what most frequently, and maybe you've alluded to this either in this episode or the last one, what most uh, frequently causes disaster in projects. Was it scope creep? Mm, yep, scope creep. Well, we've already talked about scope creep. And the okay. number one reason for scope creep is poor requirements. Okay. And the number one reason for poor requirements is you didn't talk to everybody up front to find out what their needs are. Right. So avoiding that by doing good requirements gathering up front, uh, talking to all the right people to gather their needs, prioritize those needs, and then plan the project based on everybody's needs helps mm -hmm. avoid scope creep. Okay. Another key thing I would say is gold plating, which happens a lot, especially on IT projects, which happen in HR projects. What I call the gee whiz stuff. Let's add cool stuff. Oh, let's build this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's build that. Yeah. Client's going to love this. That's yeah. gold plating. Gold plating is a choice, right? Scope creep, same end result. Scope gets bigger and uglier. Gold plating, you choose to add cool stuff. Uh, scope creep is where you don't talk to everybody up front, which is poor requirements gathering. Mm -hmm. I would also say some of the other big boo-boos you can make is we've already talked about poor risk management, mm -hmm. not yeah. looking forward at the horizon, yeah. also just plain poor planning or lack of planning mm -hmm. because we want to jump in and get doing the doing. Right. And I would also say the number one, not doing your number one job as a project manager is setting and managing expectations, oh, key st yeah. stakeholder expectations, all the way through from initiation, all the way through to closeout. Right. You know, right. It, it's like trying, if I don't set expectations, it's like trying to describe a cloud, right? Mm. Management looks at the cloud, team sees one thing, management sees something else, customer sees something else. So we need to make sure everybody is on the same page around expectations. I think that's something that HR is probably pretty familiar with is the amount of expectations folks have. I mean, I, I think we kind of live and breathe that. So maybe we would get that part. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. When do you need project management software? Ah, that's, yeah, good question. To me, to me, and I get this asked all the time, is like, you know, if I buy, buy, buy Microsoft Project, for example, now I'm a project manager. Well, my thought is, okay, if I buy Microsoft Word, does that make me Tom Clancy, right? <laughs> so it's a tool. It's a tool that I can capture my already done plan that I've done with the team. Yeah. I plan carefully with the team. Then yeah. I capture my plan. I plug it into the software to generate reports and play what ifs. Yeah. But you don't manage projects with software. You right. manage projects face-to-face -face with your people, yeah. and then you generate reports and you can play what if scenarios and look at budgets yeah. on the software. So it's yeah. a tool to help support you as you manage the project. It helps you capture your Gantt charts, your schedules. Management loves to see Gantt charts and schedules. Yeah. It helps you capture your costs. Yeah. You generate pretty reports. Yeah. Right. But you don't have to have software to manage projects. You do them on paper. Yeah. Well, okay. it's pretty, but you can, it'll be just as effective. If someone wants to learn 
to do project management, yeah. where should they go? The yeah. resources on the internet are, it is a waterfall, pun intended, but like it is, there's so much out there. Yeah, for, I would probably do it in a staged approach. First of all, do I need to be certified as a project manager or am I part, part-time? You could um, take a course, you could shadow somebody as a, you know, as a deputy project manager or as an observer just to learn. The other thing, read, there's lots of great books out there on project management. You know, I mean, some of those books are, I hate to say like project management for dummies. That's a great book. It's fantastic. It's exactly what it's designed for is okay. the basics, right? Okay. Uh, the other thing is you can join organizations like join PMI. Yeah. Become a member, go to chapter meetings, go to conferences. Yeah. Start to educate yourself. So that was supposed to be my last question. But my other question is, at some point you talked about yeah. the charter and uh, the work breakdown structure. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a bunch of other documents. Do you know of a, a place they can get stuff like that for free? As a yeah, place you know where I'd look first? Internal to my own organization. Most, almost all organizations right now, typically in IT, or if you have a PMO, go to them, and yeah. I can guarantee they will have standardized templates yeah. for your organization. 95% of the clients I deal with now, they already have internal templates. Mm -hmm. So go visit your IT folks, go do, visit the project management people. If okay. not, Google, okay. look on the net. There's tons of them out there. There's all, every template you can find, there's different flavors and versions. Yeah. But I'd start internal first. Yeah. And then go from there. Thanks, Steve. I loved that. And as I mentioned earlier, Steve and I did another episode, and a link to that one's right here. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.